that? Where does cereal come from? Dad needs his morning coffee before giving a science lesson, love. In the supermarket, duh. It has to grow first, duh. Oh yeah, on trees? Well, enough you two. It has to travel a long way before it gets to us. How far? More miles than there are grains of rice in this box. For the past 20 years, our research teams have been working across over 40 different sites in East Africa, developing detailed paleoecological and archaeological archives, and gaining a deeper understanding of the interaction between people and the environment through time and across space. This understanding of the past is crucial, since we cannot predict the future with any degree of accuracy without understanding where we've come from and how things have changed in the past. Engaruka in Tanzania is a semi-arid savanna region inhabited by pastoralist communities such as the Maasai. The unpredictable environment means they cannot depend entirely on their livestock to sustain them, so they use water management to grow crops on a limited scale. However, archaeological evidence is showing that what now appears to be mostly dry, dusty and sterile was once a vast, irrigated landscape. But by the early 1800s, European explorers discovered no evidence of people in the region. Where did they go? And why did the environment no longer support them? Given this evidence of an extensive network of abandoned irrigation canals in what is now a semi-arid environment, it is tempting to conclude that irrigation was always essential, that farming here would have always been impossible without it. But the evidence from archaeological research shows that Engaruka was once far wetter, not just wet enough to support 20 square kilometers of farmland, but wet enough that over half the fields at Engaruka were built by capturing soils carried off the mountainside by water flowing within the rivers and streams. Details like these dramatically change the way we see this landscape and challenge the once common conclusion that its eventual abandonment is a clear evidence of its failure. Every additional detail helps piece together this jigsaw. By charting the order in which fields were constructed, it is now clear that the field system was gradually built over several centuries, and that each group of fields could have easily been constructed by just a few individuals working together. This counters the previously held notion that this was a centrally planned project designed to profit a powerful elite. The careful identification of plant remains preserved in the fields and in the fireplaces where the people cooked their meals show that a wide range of cereals and vegetables were grown and eaten, refuting the idea that the system failed because it was unsustainably focused on producing a single crop. Studies of the soil chemistry and structure show no evidence of the depletion of nutrients and in some cases, the soils are better than those from the surrounding grasslands. This challenges the idea that a growing population was forced to exploit the soils to the point of exhaustion. We also see evidence of water inundation providing paddy-like conditions which could have supported the production of rice, which is now extensively grown over wetland areas in Eastern Africa. Details of this sort are essential if we are to piece together the jigsaw of how Engaruka functioned and changed through time. But ultimately, Engaruka was abandoned, and it is thus impossible to avoid the question of its sustainability. But sustainable for who, how many, and for how long? In a period of climate change, population growth, and pressure on resources, these are not just questions we need to ask about sustainability in the past, but are tough questions we need to address for the future. On a local scale, 
these landscapes and people have evolved and adapted over time. On a global scale, we too will need to adapt. <laughs>